Professor Joao Abreu Silva from the University of Lisbon talking about um, fuel consumption and transit and we're joking that now fuel prices are down but we all know this is not going to last so topic is still very timely um, so Joao uh, thank you very much good morning to you all and thank you for having me here um, well, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a work that we did in Lisbon, um, which started with some master dissertations that I was involved into its advisory, and we worked closely with a bus company in Lisbon. And uh, although the prices went down, basically in Europe, the price for one liter of fuel, of gasoline, is... 80% of the price for a gallon of fuel in the US. So although the prices went down, it is still much more expensive in Europe to buy gasoline or diesel than here in the United States. So it, it's still very important uh, to uh, our bus operators. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fuel consumption in bus operation. In general, what the research so far has been telling us, what are the main factors? And then I'm going to pass to our case study, which is from this, company, this bus company operating in Lisbon. So, well, transportation has a very strong role in uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, and uh, it has been responsible for around 23% in all world energy consumption. So this is an important issue because it's related with general efficiency in, in um, in transportation and also with climate change. Uh, in the case of a bus company, uh, fuel consumption is very important for their budgets. It usually represents a very high proportion in their costs. Usually there are three main uh, issues related with uh, their costs that are very important for them. One of them is staff costs, the other one is basically fuel, and the other one is tires, which is also related with the, the amount of uh, kilometers or miles that they drive. So optimizing uh, their resources, uh, and it could go for having more fuel efficient vehicles or training drivers better in order to have a, a driving style that uh, saves fuel. Uh, it's a very important part of their strategies in order to reduce fuel consumption. So in terms of uh, the empirical studies that have been made so far uh, relating fuel consumption in, in, in bus operating. So several uh, characteristics related with the, vehicle, the type of vehicles that are being used, the physical and operational characteristics of the lines or their routes, uh, and the driving behavior, and also policies that, be, that have been implemented by companies like training drivers or monitorization of their behavior. Um, are usually the main uh, elements that are explored in this type of studies. Uh, so the initiatives that have been taken in terms of the vehicle size, so basically relate with having more efficient powertrains, so having uh, more efficient consumption by the vehicles, and also in transmission systems. So th there has been a huge evolution in terms of having more fuel efficient vehicles. But now, and uh, there is a downsize on that, because at the same time, vehicles have been more efficient, but vehicles have been more and more um, becoming more uh, fuel uh, consuming, because for example, they start to have, now there's one thing that was not common, but now this is quite common, having air conditioning systems. So this, Although the vehicle, the, 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 the driving is much more efficient, increases fuel consumption because uh, air conditioning systems um, consume a lot of um, fuel. And also, if you consider in places like uh, in Lisbon, that you can have on a hot summer day in July or August, 35 degrees Celsius, uh, it makes the necessity of having 
air conditioning working, uh, a very important thing. So what the, they are starting to feel now in these companies is that although they have been more very efficient in reducing their fuel consumption, now new needs and new regulations make them spend more fuel and so increase their costs. Not because they are not being efficient, but these efficiency gains have been kind of eaten by these new regulations and these new uh, comfort characteristics of their vehicles. Also, uh, maintenance is also relevant. So if you have a vehicle that is not properly maintained, what happens is that it will consume much more fuel. So the maintenance programs are relevant for them, and also not just program maintenance, but some kind of emergency maintenance. So knowing that the vehicle has, have, has a, a specific problem that increases its fuel consumption as soon as it's possible, it's, it, it can uh, have a, an important effect on maintaining a fuel consumption low. Because if you have to wait like one month until it goes to the program maintenance operations, then it has a month that is consuming much more fuel than it should be consuming. Also, training actions uh, have been proving to be effective, but what we see from the literature is that the people are reporting that these training uh, um, actions are effective, but their effect decreases with time. So after drivers uh, leave the, the training actions for a week or two, they maintain a, a fuel saving driving style, but then this style tends to be uh, reduced as time goes by. So more systematic approaches that have been made by uh, several researchers f focus in on these four aspects. So energy efficiency of the bus, of the vehicle itself, so it's basically related with the vehicle weight. So if you use uh, lighter vehicles, then uh, you consume less, and road grade. So if you are uh, driving in, in, a, in a road with very high uh, grades and very uh, inclined slopes, then what happens is that you consume more, even with a more fuel efficient vehicle. Also, the driving cycle of the bus operation. So if you drive at higher speeds, or if you, ha if you drive with speeds that are quite different from the optimum speed in terms of fuel consumption. So if you have a lot of stops, a lot of accelerations, a lot of decelerations, uh, this increases fuel consumption. Traffic environment, so if you're driving in a place where you have a lot of congestion, of course, uh, this will increase uh, fuel consumption and also as the road surface conditions. So if you have different type of pavements, will create different uh, levels of attrition and then this will reflect also on fuel consumption. And also uh, the bus use, so it's basically how much people are in the bus, so if you have less people in the bus, of course, it will be lighter, so it will consume less. But then this is also related what we want in the end. What we want in the end is not the bus that consumes a very small amount of fuel, but transporting people as efficient as possible. So uh, the, 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 the perfect unit here will be uh, fuel uh, liters or, or gallons by passenger kilometer or by passenger mile. So some, some empirical studies, um, so they found, for example, Ang and, and, and Fua uh, found that routes and vehicle types are the most significant influences on fuel efficiency and basically average speed and um, loaded weight. They also cons consider that driver behavior also counted, but not as much as uh, the previous uh, factors. Uh, more recent studies uh, basically found out that speed, acceleration, and road grade were uh, very important to explain the variability of fuel consumption. And a recent study uh, that took place in Portugal found that average speed, average positive acceleration, so the rate of acceleration, and average distance between stops as being 
the most adequate parameters to, produce, to predict fuel consumption. Also, we have to uh, distinct here between different approaches. So there are ap the approach that we follow here, basically we collected data on all the buses and all the routes that they had. But sometimes, uh, several of these studies which are uh, undertaken, for example, in mechanical engineering uh, departments, they usually instrument a single bus or a couple of buses, and they uh, collect data on all the driving cycle and all the, um, the parameters of the engine and so on. So they don't have sometimes data on the average network and the average and, and the total buses, but they collect data focusing on, on a specific vehicle or, or a series of specific vehicles, and they collect this data for um, an extended period of time. So now going back to the case study, um, so a little bit of about Lisbon before uh, going on to the core of the study. So Lisbon is the capital of Portugal, and it's basically the same size as the same size as Portland, so around 600,000 in inhabitants. Although the metro area is bigger than in the case of Portland, because we have almost three million inhabitants, which represents around 26% of the total population of Portugal. Um, and Lisbon is, is the headquarters of the, one of the two metrop big metropolitan areas in the country. So the first one is uh, Lisbon, and then you have the second one, which is Porto, and Porto is the second city of the country, up north uh, in the country. Uh, and so on, this, on my left side is Spain, uh, and as they don't, in their maps of Spain, don't show Portugal, they show a blank space in Portugal, we are doing more or less the same showing a blank space in the case of Spain. Uh, so the metropolitan area, it consists of 18 municipalities, which are divided by uh, the mouth of the river Tejo, which is one of the biggest rivers in the Iberian Peninsula. So we have the, 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 the area that is called Greater Lisbon, and then another uh, re region which also belongs to the metropolitan area, which is called uh, the peninsula of Stubal, which is south of the river. Um, and of course, municipalities here are more or less equivalent to counties. So uh, in Portugal, we don't have uh, space that is allocated to the central state by itself. So the country is all divided in municipalities, so the municipalities have their seat or their headquarters in, in the city or in the, in the, in the small town that is the headquarters of that municipality, but they, com but they constitute also a series of other territory which is under the jurisdiction of the municipal government. So basically, when you, with exception of Lisbon and Oporto, uh, there are no other municipalities in, in Portugal that only are constituted by the urban area. All of them have, have also part of a, of a rural area or a non-urbanized area. Also, the region of Lisbon is the country's economic powerhouse. It represents 37% of the GDP of the country, so it's much more than its population in terms of its relative weight. And um, the company in which we make this study is a company called Rodoviária de Lisboa, which is uh, a private company operating in a series of uh, bus lines that are concessioned by the, um, the central government, and uh, they operate basically on the northeast part of the Lisbon metropolitan area. So you can see on this map here, which indicates more or less the main bus stops of their lines. So with this, the, the area encompassed by all of these signs represents more or less the area where they, uh, they serve. So basically, they, they have a lot of uh, bus lines that are suburban bus lines that drive people towards Lisbon because Lisbon is also the main center of employment in the metropolitan area. And they have a series of other local uh, lines that serve uh, directly only the municipalities uh, 
that are served by this, uh, this operator, which are basically Lourdes, Odivelas, uh, and uh, Vila Franca de Xira, which are two municipalities um, northeast of Lisbon, three municipalities northeast of Lisbon. Uh, basically, they serve a population, directly a population of 400,000 people, inhabitants, and they have around 200,000 passengers a day. They have 94 lines, and these lines, a great part of them are suburban lines. Others are local lines, and there are a few um, circular um, urban lines that, for example, connect some of these uh, cities to uh, main um, train stations, so they act as feeders to, to trains. They have this nine, these 94 lines represent 4 1,500 kilometers that they drive each day, and for this operation they have a fleet of 375 buses. The average age of their vehicles, it's uh, almost 15 years old, so you can say that they are uh, fairly old buses, although they are trying to renew their fleet. But one of the things is that as they renewed their fleet, some of these new buses are much more efficient than the old buses, but they came equipped with more uh, luxuries, namely air conditioning, so in the end, they don't increase so much their fuel efficiency. Also, they implemented a system which was also in part developed in, in IST, my school, by the mechanical engineering department, which was called GISFROT, which is a fleet management program that they implemented. So they instrumented several uh, buses with this system, and we are going to see later on how, more or less how it works. And basically, um, the idea of this fraud is that they collect data on real time. And um, this data on real time allows them to compare the performance of drivers based on a series of events that can occur or not, and some of these events are related to the driving style of the, of the driver, like uh, a brake that is not supposed to happen at that moment, uh, excessive speed, uh, or other elements that are related with problems that the engine might have. So this also gives them information for two things. One is that they could go and talk to the drivers and say what the drivers are doing that is not correct. And second thing, they could speed up maintenance operations because they know that this specific bus is having problems in their engine, so it should not continue to uh, circulate, but it should um, go directly to the workshop. So basically, these results in terms of the overall global fuel consumption represent, until we, we made this study, about 2.5% of their global fuel consumption, which is an important result. So basically, this is how the, how does the GISFROT works. So they, they, they have, they collect the data on a bus. They download via wireless uh, the data to a computer. It is, it is exported to the information system and this information system gives them um, indicators that they could then present to the drivers and explain what they are doing that is not correct. So this also works as a, as a tool to um, perfect their, um, their monitoring and their training sessions with the drivers. Uh, and some of this data that I'm presenting in this slide is, is an interesting result that we have. So we made this study in these dissertations. And then last July, they asked us to come there and show us some of these results. So basically saying that we liked the study that we make and we are very worried about these issues. And then this is some of the results that we are getting. So basically, this is our several um, um, behaviors in terms of the indicators that they collect. So the first one is uh, you, you start driving very fast, so it's a, it's a, um, the second one is a, is a, is a brake 
uh, very excessive break and very strong break. The third one is excessive speed. Uh, the fourth is excessive rotation in the engine. And the fifth is um, idle uh, running of the engine with excessive uh, rotations. So as you can see, this is from July to 2010 to December 2010. And then the, the, the second uh, data is based on the 19, uh, 2013. And as you can see, all of these occurrences have decreased. So the number of times compared to the hours that they have of driving of all their buses and, and their drivers. So they, the program allow them to reduce even more the number of these occurrences that are related with driving behavior. Also, they are doing another thing. So they have a fleet composed of different types of vehicles. So during peak hours, because most of these lines are suburban lines, during peak hours, they have a higher demand of passengers. So what they are doing is that they are replacing in the between peak hours the, the buses by smaller buses because you don't need that capacity of around 100 passengers or 100 seats because you're just transporting 20 or 30 passengers. So they are doing this, uh, this management, but although this allowed them to reduce a lot their fuel consumption, it has a limitation because, well, at a certain point, you need to have basically two fleets. One fleet for the peak hours and another fleet for the off-peak hours. And this means a lot of money that is, a, is an investment that you have to make on your fleet. So although they are optimizing their fuel consumption, they are not optimizing their fleet size. Also, we can see here um, some other indicators in terms of their uh, fuel efficiency. So um, the first one, gasoil, basically is diesel. So the amount of liters of diesel that they have been uh, using on a yearly basis. So they decreased 16% their um, diesel consumption. But they also decreased 12% the kilometers driven partly because they are optimizing uh, their supply, so cutting in some lines that were not, that were not having as many passengers that it was considered by them to be um, efficient in terms of driving. Uh, so basically what they gained was around 5% in terms of reduction of uh, fuel consumption. So their efficiency increased by 5%. So this is basically um, an interesting result. So they managed to, re to become more efficient. But if you consider passengers, transported passengers, so we have here the gross, the gross in a energy product, which is more or less similar uh, to the um, values in, in, in fuel. So they also decreased 16% between 2004 and 2014, but as you can see, the number of passengers basically more than doubled uh, in terms of reduction, the reduction of energy consumption. So in the end, by passenger kilometer, they are less efficient. So this is a cause of several other issues related with pricing policies, planning policies in terms of um, of the transportation system in Lisbon and also a result of um, changing lifestyles. So what happened is that um, transit patronage has been an, on, a de, on a decrease in Portugal and specifically in the Lisbon metropolitan area since the beginning of the 90s. So, and this basically shows uh, a bit of, their, of, of this result. So now going back to the case that uh, we were doing, so 
we collected data on two periods using the GSFROD system and also using other uh, data that they have. And we collected in two periods, so between November of 2009 and March of 2010, which we used to build models to explain fuel consumption. And then between May and September 2010 to validate those models. So we were able to do one thing that uh, it's not often found in transportation. It's like you are using data to calibrate some models and then you are using independent data to validate those models. Most of the time we struggle with enough data so we don't have data to spare to, to do this. But nevertheless, um, there are some caveats here that we should be aware of them. So fuel consumption registry is basically uh, based on the checking the amount of fuel uh, required to completely fill the vehicle's tanks. So sometimes there are errors in the registry of this data because it's not automatically registered. So it's basically registered on the logs of the company. So we have cases of unrealistic values. And they were, those were removed from our data set. Also, we have data on the slopes or grades in the, in the, in the, in the routes of these buses but we were unable to consider if it was a positive grade, meaning an up, upward slope or a downward slope. So we aggregated those uh, because we are considering daily fuel consumption. And more or less they, they balance each other because you have more or less the same amount of circulations in one way and in the different, and in the different direction. What could happen is that when you have uh, routes that do not follow in the different in the two ways the same the same roads because you have for example one one way roads and of course when you're coming back you cannot use that same road so in these cases you might have some errors and this happens mainly in in the dense urban centers where you have a higher um, percentage of one way roads um, the vehicle sample was limited to the vehicles that were equipped with the onboard system. So although they have been equipping most of their vehicles with the onboard system of GSFROT, they were not able to do that for all the, their fleet. So our sample size in terms of vehicles was limited to that. And then there was another thing that this is the, I would say, the biggest problem in this study is that we didn't have data on the passengers that were transported. We have the total amount of data in the, in the total number of transported passengers, but we don't have that by line. Or because we are considering this by line or route, by driver or by vehicle, we cannot have the data uh, for all of these uh, divisions in, in our case study. So we were unable to have things about the passengers. So basically this is um, all of the, um, the variables that we test. So what we did, we test three models. One, studying fuel consumption by route. So for each one of the routes that they have, we, we studied the fuel consumption. Another one, by vehicle, because uh, uh, vehicles could be assigned to different routes. Um, in different hours of the day. And another one by driver, because drivers could be assigned to different routes or can be assigned to different vehicles also. So we have a series of variables that we consider here. So we consider, for example, um, the number of training hours that each driver had, the commercial speed, which is the average speed that the bus uses in, the, in their route, uh, considering the, the times that they are, it's traveling um, at the normal speed, stops, uh, acceleration, deceleration. So it's an average considered all of this. So if you have uh, very close stops, your commercial speed will decrease, but also it could decrease if you are facing a lot of congestion because these buses don't have 
uh, specific bus corridors. Uh, the type of vehicle, if it is a minibus, if it is what they call a midi bus, if it is a standard vehicle, or if it is an articulated vehicle. So basically, an articulated vehicle will transport 100 and something passengers. Uh, the, the percentage of routes with more than, uh, of routes with more than 5% slope, average length of the route, so if you have a bigger route, in theory, you might have higher commercial speed. Uh, the, the logarithm of the, of the average commercial speed, because we have here uh, effects that are not linear, so we have to transform some of these uh, variables. Uh, maximum distance of stops, uh, the average of the age of the drivers, uh, the logarithm of the mass of the vehicle, and then we have all of these variables that I put in bold, which are variables collected directly by the system gist fraud, which is loading air with excessive rotation in the engine. So they usually have to load air because they have hydraulic systems for closing and opening doors and several things. So they need to load air to, in those systems because they are hydraulic, but they function with air pressure instead of liquid pressure. So they need to restore the, the pressure in those systems sometimes. So they need to load air. One of the things that Rodoviar at Lisboa made was that they usually do this on the vehicles. So they reduced as much as possible this type of operation in the vehicles. So when the vehicles go to the workshop, they have an air compressor which charges the system. So in th with this, they managed to reduce their fuel consumption by a lot. The longitudinal decelerations and uh, the engine rotation above the maximum value. So, and these events were coded by their number, so 1014, 40, 1007, and 1067. So they have a list of events which are coded in their system. So these are the results of the, of the, of the models that we get. So basically, um, I don't know how much of you are familiar with uh, multivariate statistics. Uh, but usually uh, the, the raw square is a, it's a measure of um, fit in the model. So if we have values that are very close to one, means that our model fits very well the data. So basically we have very good uh, model uh, fitting statistics. And if you look at this table here, uh, you can see that the validation so the R square of the validation model, so applying the model with the coefficients that we got to the new data, of course it decreases the values of the R square, but we still manage to have um, pretty good um, uh, results. So looking now at the effect of each uh, um, variable, so we built these three models, one for the lines or routes, and basically what we have is that, um, so this is the, the standardized uh, coefficient, so if I have uh, four uh, crosses, it means that the value is above or equal, or above 0 .0 0 0.75, three between 0.25 or 0.75, uh, two between 0.1 and 0.25, and just one cross um, lower than 0.10. So basically, it means that what are the, the the effects that I, the cases that I have either three crosses or three minus signal, signals are the ones that are very relevant, explaining these results. So as we can see. Well, the type of vehicle is quite important. So if you have a, a line that uses um, much more vehicles, uh, bigger vehicles, which m this will mean that this line will have an average fuel consumption higher than the other lines. Also, the commercial speed is quite important. So basically, if you have stops that are very close of, or if this line is very affected by road congestion, then it means that this line will have higher uh, fuel consumption. 
uh, the maximum distance between stops, uh, which is also related uh, with the commercial speed, is also important. Uh, and also the, the slope in our case. But what was important in here, the policy variable that was quite important for um, Rodoviaria de Lisboa, which basically says to them, you are doing right, is the number of days of, the number of hours of training. So it means that having this uh, training sessions with the drivers is producing results. All of the other values are more or less what we already know, and, and uh, of course, the model validates the, the results that they have, but it doesn't tell them something completely new. Uh, also, we calculated here uh, some elasticities considering the, the values of the mean. Um, so, I assume that you are familiar with the concept of elasticity, or not? I, so basically, it's briefly, is a, if I, uh, it's a, vari a percentage variation of some variable when I variate the, uh, another variable, like for 10% or 1%. So it's a, a rate of, of variations. So it means that the, the values with higher elasticity, in absolute terms, are the ones that are more sensitive. Of course, um, not all of these elasticities are constant among all the values that we have. So we have some cases here that show us that some variable, some variable might have higher um, effect in the coefficients of the model, but might have uh, a lower uh, elasticity here. And this is because of we are calculating the elasticities on the mean. So if I go to a certain uh, other value, it will have different uh, effect. So in here, for example, the commercial speed is the one with the biggest elasticity, and it's an elasticity that depends on the value of the commercial speed that I'm having at that moment. So, uh, which will mean that with higher commercial speed, it will have a bigger effect than with lower commercial speed. Now, considering the, the, res the, um, the model for the drivers, um, as you can see, all of the, the type of vehicles that enter in this model uh, are important. Once again, the slope, um, the commercial speed, and the average length of the, of the, of the line. Um, and also, some, one of these events, which is the event 107, which is um, the excessive rotation with admission of air. And once again, I have here, um, we calculated also these elasticities. So as we see, once again, commercial speed, it's quite uh, important. Although the type of vehicle is the one with a higher elasticity, uh, 0 0.17 in absolute term. And finally, we have the model for the vehicles. And of course, it shows here immediately the, the mass of the vehicle, so the number of tonnage, tons that uh, each vehicle weights, also the commercial speed, the average length of the, of the line. And in here, we show the driver, in this case, uh, the driver's age of the drivers that run uh, those vehicles. So what this means is that older drivers tend to be more renitent to accept new, to, to start with new behaviors. So this has an effect of some kind of rigidity as we get older, so we are less prone to change our behavior, and this uh, shows uh, clear here. Once again, and of course, the, the, the elasticity of the, of, the, um, of the mass of the vehicles is, is completely out of scale in this case because it weights a lot, uh, but also, once again, the commercial speed has very relevant um, elasticity, and in this case, uh, the driver's age, which has also a, a, a relevant value when compared to the other ones. So, our conclusions are basically like, well, vehicle type is basically the most influential variable. 
So if you are able to manage the vehicles and if you are able to go to more fuel efficient vehicles, then you'll be better off. But it's quite important. This measure has a limitation. You cannot put all of, the, all of these lines with just mini buses, which consume like 16 liters of diesel by 100 kilometers travel, whereas a, a big bus will consume between 60 and 75, 80 liters of diesel by 100 kilometers driven. So there is a, a limit to changing the fleet. Also, commercial speed is also an important factor. So it means that this they could try to change. In some cases, um, they are able, for example, to divert some of these routes to less congested, to less congested roads, or they could increase the distance between stops. But then this will have an effect, because this might affect on their demand, because people are not willing to travel so much to um, a bus stop to travel a longer distance to catch a bus. So this creates a problem that they have to, to see. And this will be very dependent on the type of demand that they have. So we know, for example, in the case of Lisbon, in the case of the urban bus operator, that most of their demand e, uh, is of older people, usually a lot of retired people. So what happens is that for these fellows, Waiting for a bus is not a big problem because they don't have schedules to, to, to fulfill. They, they don't have to be at a certain time, at a certain period. If they go to the doctor, they will show up like three hours earlier. So there is not, not much of this problem. Uh, but they, they value very much the comfort in the access to the, to the bus stop. And of course, this creates a conundrum because it makes them impossible for them to try to catch other types of demand which will be more sensitive to uh, lower travel times, to increase frequency, and they will be willing to walk farther away to catch the bus if they know that it will take, us, will take them less time and the bus will be more frequent. So there's, you have this tension here that these companies have to manage. Also, the, the, the important thing of the drivers so basically, the, the, their, uh, their bet on starting to train their drivers was a, a good bet that they made, was a, a, a smart management decision. Then we also have also other aspects, which is the driver's age. So as drivers get older, or if you, if you have older drivers uh, that are more renitent to change their behavior, um, and not just drivers. Uh, they can have these other people that are working in their workshops. We have different behaviors that were formed in the period where fuel consumption was not such a problem. Um, this, these behaviors are much more difficult to change. And so um, there are some here some, some clues of some ideas that... Um, could be considered. So first one is the improvement of the data collection process, which Rodoviar um, at Lisboa is trying to do nowadays because they implemented uh, smart ticketing systems. So nowadays they have smart cards because all the system was, in, a smart card system was implemented in the Lisbon metropolitan area. It started to be implemented in 2008, but first within the main rail operators and the bus operator in, in, the, in the city of Lisbon, and then they started to um, put this system available to other operators that operate in the, in, the, in the suburban lines. Also, another thing which will be important is the, the cost-benefit ratio of these measures. So some of these measures cost not don't cost much, and they could give you very high benefits, but others will cost a lot of money. So you need to, to do some cost-benefit analysis of these measures. Uh, also, another thing which could be, okay, instead of doing this model that we did for all of their network, if you have more data for a longer period of time, we could do this for 
specific groups of lines or for some different um, geographical areas and see which areas are more different than others. Also because, for example, traffic congestion will be different, will be different between different geographical areas. Uh, definition of objective in terms of driver monitoring and, and informative training. So instead of saying them what they are doing bad, it's trying to put some goals to, to these guys. And basically one thing which, which would be interesting also is a periodic validation of these models and possibly readjusting them. So with this, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Um, this is basically the, the document where this, this, this presentation is based on is a paper that is currently under uh, reviewing and resubmitting for Transport Research Part D. So we hope we, in the end we get published. And uh, also we, we, I need to acknowledge Rodoviaire de Lisboa and also my co-authors in, in this paper, and particularly Rodoviaire de Lisboa, which was very helpful for us in doing all of this um, study. So if anyone has any questions. Uh, you, you had mentioned that um, generally transit ridership in Lisbon had had decreased over time. Um, is it is it you had, you'd also alluded to the fact that <clears throat> older folks were more likely to ride the bus? Is that is that the reason you think? Is it a generational shift or or what? It's part of a generation shift. So, I to make a long story short. So uh, when Portugal uh, entered the European Union in the mid. 80s, we were one of the poorest countries of all Europe, and so um, car ownership was very small, so people usually um, used much more public transportation. What happened is that in the years until recently, although um, the quality of the public transportation system has increased, car ownership has increased much more because of uh, rising incomes, and also the perception of people was a bit different. So their perceptions and their desire for comfort increased much more than the quality of public transportation. So we have a huge shift, which is also made possible because the successive governments uh, build a lot of road infrastructure. So we have here a, 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 a series of elements that basically uh, made the demand of these public transportation systems more and more old people, uh, more and more people that we call captives. So the ones that don't have access to a car because they don't have yet, are not yet of age to drive or because they don't have the income to possess a car or because they are not anymore allowed to, to drive because of their age. So. This is some kind of a sad story in terms of uh, transportation policy outcomes, but I think it's more or less a bit the story of the all developed world in terms of decreasing ridership in public transportation systems. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that there were barriers to uh, transit applying to different types of demand, like those people who are not captives. And uh, we just mentioned it again. Do you, do you have ideas of what could uh, help change the system so that we could integrate more of those uh, different types of demands? So younger professionals, uh, mm -hmm. any, anyone not, not captive right now? Well, uh, one of the things that you could do, but that will mean a ton of money in terms of investment, is shifting more and more to rail-based systems. We know, for example, that usually uh, bus users, the percentage of captives is around 90%, whereas in rail-based systems it's around 60%, 70%. But that is a huge investment. You could also try to increase the quality of the service and probably with less uh, investment, um, <coughs> trying to know better what are the demand and what this demand is uh, sensitive to, which 
unfortunately, um, the general uh, transit companies in, our, in Portugal are not very sensitive to, to this, so they, they are not very sensitive in terms of demand. The idea is that we give this supply in transit and people will take the bus if they want or not. And uh, so they could try to, to have different measures and, 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 and like increasing frequencies, um, <coughs> increasing the quality of some services to try to attract uh, more people. But then they have a problem which is <coughs> exacerbated by the recent crisis and still ongoing crisis is that the government basically said to them, well, you are running on a deficit, so you have to cut your costs. And what this does this mean is that they reduce frequencies, they increase prices, they reduce operating hours. So this makes the system less and less attractive. And so you have this conundrum because if you want to attract more demand, at least if you increase your supply, you will run at least a period of time on a huge deficit until people start to realize that this might be a good option. And also you need other measures like land use measures, which like compacting more or not allowing uh, a huge spread in terms of suburbanization uh, or not uh, offering so much uh, road capacity or, for example, uh, enforcing more um, parking uh, in terms of not allowing people to park illegally or increasing parking costs. So all of these measures need to be taken into consideration in terms of a single strategy, which a lot of us talk about this, and probably you talk here in your classes, and I, I, I talked this also in Lisbon, but we have been talking for this for like 40 or 50 years, but things take much time, much more time to, to, to go than to think. Thanks. Okay. Oh, was there a question back there first? Okay. Yeah, I think you may have already answered my question with your last uh, comment, but I was wondering if Lisbon or uh, any of the other municipalities in Portugal have looked at um, protected bus lanes or potentially grade-separated rapid transit routes as a way of addressing uh, commercial speed inefficiencies or uh, traffic congestion issues or grade issues? Um, there is a lot of um, bus, um, bus corridors in Lisbon. So basically, all of the all of the all of the major uh, routes in terms of buses inside of Lisbon have bus protected lanes, although the enforcement is sometimes a little bit sketchy, uh, and this is the one of the major problems. Um, but uh, so it's not a problem of increasing the number of uh, bus corridors because they're already existed. Uh, it's also a matter of enforcing them, or in some cases, it's a problem that they have a sh very short distance between stops, sometimes 150 meters or less than that. So this impacts very strongly on commercial speed. So they have commercial speeds of around 15 to 12, 10 kilometers an hour. If you go to, for example, which doesn't have bus corridors in most of their routes, but because they, they, they are using a, um, a different type of lines, more suburban lines with bigger distances between stops, their commercial speed tends to be higher. Also, there are some ideas of, um, well, Lisbon used to have a very developed tram uh, network. Most of it has been... Um, discontinued, so there are some trams that continue to operate, and mostly nowadays they are basically used by uh, tourists, because they are very nice and they go to the historical parts of the city, So, uh, but they don't have protection. And the worst case of not protecting them is not an issue of cars circulating on their corridors. Is a legally parked car in their corridor, and that basically it disrupts completely the system. Um, but there are some ideas of trying to implement some new systems of BRT 
and probably I recently concluded a study of, of for a system of BRT, which the idea is start first with the BRT because you don't have many invest, much investment, and then probably migrate that to a LRT system if demand goes up accordingly. So there are plans to do this, but unfortunately at this moment you don't have so much capital to invest, so things are, are a bit... Uh, stopped in this direction. But I, I believe that, for example, you could have other systems like ITS-based systems with several um, new applications and, and so on that could be used to attract demand. I think there was a question. No? Going back to the results, one question about the age and the impact of age on uh, consumption. So I noticed that older drivers tend to spend more fuel, but is there any union kind of rule or something? Like sometimes companies assign the most experienced driver to the most difficult buses, like <coughs> articulated or to the most difficult route or line. So is, is there any... Union, uh, unionization might be a possibility, although I, I purposely didn't talk about this because Rodovia de Lisboa is a private company. So where the unions are more active is in Carrige, which is a, a state-owned company. So they tend, well, because the unions are made basically affected to some specific political parties, and then when the government is from a different party, so they use this for political strife. Whereas in private companies, although they might have some unionization, but they tend to adopt both the management and the unions a more... Um, let's say, uh, a, a less political option, and sometimes they tend to reach agreements in a, in a more easy way than in these uh, state-owned companies. So, yes, it's possible that unionization might have some uh, effect on this, but I would say that probably another thing might be um, that the type of contract, either if they are unionized or not, of older people are more secure against being fired or something this than the young people contracts. So this also might play a role in this, in this discussion. So, okay. um, this is kind of related. So you mentioned the age of the drivers made a difference. Did you like ever either or look at or consider looking at the experience of the drivers? Because I feel like if a driver had been driving it longer, they might be able to change more, or did you look at that at all? That is a very interesting question. We didn't look at it because of the type of the data that we have, mm -hmm. but we could basically follow that up with some kind of uh, in-depth interviews with the drivers and so on, and that could give us some interesting insights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We are running out of time, so I think uh, we're going to end here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And of course, if you have any doubts or thing, my mail is available here, so you 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 are feel free to. Ask.